Hi guys, welcome to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago. I'm a philosophy professor in the UK. Today we are continuing with the philosophy glossary, trying to explain all of those difficult concepts and isms that you come across when you are studying philosophy. Today we're going to be looking at this concept of supervenience. Okay, I'm going to try and explain to you what this word means and why philosophers go on about it so much. Okay, supervenience. What does it mean and what role does it play in contemporary philosophy? It's a kind of dependence relationship. So it's trying to capture the way that some phenomena depends on another phenomena. And I'll give you a heads up where we're going with this. It frequently crops up when we're thinking about the mind. Okay, so we're thinking about the way in which the mind might depend on my brain, the physical world or whatever. Lots of philosophers say that the mind supervenes on the brain. So we're going to explain what supervenience means and how it helps out in these tricky cases like the mind-brain relationship. Okay, so let's just start with what this word means, supervenience. It's a, it's a made-up word. It's a made-up term of art that philosophers use. It basically comes from Latin and it basically means coming in above or beyond. It's kind of suggesting a kind of emergence. So it's like, imagine that here at this level, we've got some phenomena that we've got like some grasp on and imagine out of it coming this other phenomena that we want to understand. Think of it as a bit like emergence. That's not quite how I understand it. I think of it in terms of a dependence relationship. So we've got something here and we've got another phenomena coming up here and this one is going to depend on this one. But that's a bit fluffy. What exactly do we mean by that? OK, there's lots of different kind of dependence relationships out there in the world. Lots of them are causal, but supervenience is a non-causal relationship. So it's not about one thing causing another. How could that be? What do we mean by that? Let me give you an example that hopefully shows the difference. Right, suppose we're playing snooker or pool or whatever. We've got some balls, we've got a cue, you whack the balls. They fly around the table and eventually settle in a V shape. Okay, so we've got a V made up of balls on the table. We could tell a causal story about how they got there. I whacked the cue ball, that whacked all the other balls, they bounced off the cushions and they ended up settling into this V shape. That's a causal story. So the causal dependence of how they end up where they were has got stuff to do with like me whacking the balls and the physics of them bouncing around and all that sort of stuff. But there's other kinds of dependencies that are non-causal. So forget the history of how the balls got there, me whacking them, all that kind of business, and just look at them right now, a snapshot of time right now. The balls make up this V shape. Why is it a V? Well, because that's the way the balls are arranged. So there is the V shape and it depends on the arrangement of the balls. You wouldn't be able to get that V shape unless the balls were arranged like that. The V can't move around the table unless the balls move around the table. OK, so the V, its properties depend on the arrangement of the balls. OK, that's an example of supervenience. We say that the, the V shape and its properties, like its location and its size and all that business, supervene on the arrangement of the balls. It non-causally depends on their arrangement. Another way to put it would be you couldn't have a change in the V shape without a change in the arrangement of the snooker balls, OK? The V shape couldn't move, it couldn't change into a W or an X or whatever unless the balls were rearranged. So that's a pretty common definition of supervenience. Phenomena X supervenes on phenomena Y just in case there couldn't be a change to the X stuff without there being a change to the Y stuff, OK? So there couldn't be a change to the V shape without there being a change to the arrangement of the snooker balls. Let me just give you another example, just because this stuff is kind of difficult. I think examples really help. OK, so suppose we've got some text on the screen. OK, S computer screens, they're made up of lots of little dots, lots of little pixels. OK, so I've got some letters on the screen. And if we zoom in really, really close up, I'm going to see all those little squares. OK, so we could say that the letters supervene on the arrangement of those dots. OK, and if we kind of zoom out, we see the, the letters. And if we zoom out a bit more, we see the words and the sentences. 
all of those things are supervening on the thing before. Okay, so the sentence supervenes on the words and the words supervene on the letters and the letters supervene on the arrangement of the, the pixels, the dots on the screen. That's a non-causal dependency. Each thing, the, the words, they depend on the letters which depend on the dots on the screen. So there couldn't be a change in the higher level without there being a corresponding change in the lower level. So that's a necessary relationship. There couldn't be a change here without there being a change here. And a slightly different way of putting that would be any possible world where you've got the subvenient base, so like the arrangement of pixels on the screen, you would have the supervenient phenomena. So any possible world, any possible situation in which the pixels on the screen are arranged like this, you're going to have those letters on the screen. That's supervenience. That's the definition of supervenience. So what's it for? What's the point of all of this? Supervenience often crops up in contemporary philosophy when we're talking about the mind, the relationship between the mind and physical stuff, in particular the brain or the brain, your central nervous system, your body, your environment, that kind of stuff. So often you hear philosophers saying that the mind supervenes on the brain. Basically there we're saying that the mind non-causally depends on the brain. So like the mind is like the letters on the screen and the brain is like the arrangement of the pixels. Given that the brain has a certain configuration right now, like given that there's certain stuff happening in my brain, my mind will be a certain way. And that's not a causal relationship. It's not saying that my brain is causing my mind to do certain stuff. It's basically saying it's constituting it, okay? Given that my brain is in a certain way, my mind has to be in a certain configuration as well. Just like when you've got the pixels on the screen in a certain way, you've got certain letters on the screen also. Now, in saying that the mind supervenes on the brain, we're not really explaining how it does that. So like, why does my current mental situation feel a certain way? Why does drinking coffee taste that way? Why does a cold room feel the way it does? There's no explanation of that. So it's not really an explanation of the mind. It's just a statement, okay? Saying that the mind supervenes on the brain is just a statement of a certain dependence relation on physical stuff. So it's one popular way that physicalists about the mind explain what they mean by physicalism. OK, physicalism means the mind in some way depends on physical stuff, the brain and whatever. And one precise way of cashing that out is in terms of supervenience. The mind supervenes on the brain. It's not a complete explanation. It's not really any explanation of how it does that. It's just a position statement saying it does and then we're going to try and work out and give an explanation of how it does that later on. OK, guys, so there we have a super short introduction to this pretty difficult and technical concept of supervenience. It can take a while to get your head around this. So, you know, stick with it. Look at the examples. Look at the definition. If it doesn't make much sense to you, leave me a question down below in the comments. I try to respond to all of them. I hope you found this useful. If you have, give me a thumbs up. That really helps me out on YouTube. I'm going to be doing plenty more philosophy glossary over the next couple of weeks. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get notifications. Thanks so much for watching this far and I hope to see you back here soon. Yeah.